Hi there. Welcome to Sky Gazing. This is Gayatri Jairaman, your host. Thank you for returning for our third edition of the books, uh, Reflections. And uh, today, if in just in case you thought the three books weren't ambitious enough, in uh, episode two, I've sort of uh, gone for four books this time. Uh, you must be thinking that. you know i've really lost it but um i really didn't have a choice a uh, beginning with uh, du removing draupadi from the uh, syllabus um by mahashweta devi that's a version that i definitely want to look at um i'm also going to be looking at ira mukherjee's uh, song of draupadi but also when we look at both of these it's important to look at sai swarupa's draupadi the tale of an empress and um also the uh, original major work on the theme which is chitra banerji uh, divakarni's um palace of illusions and i've actually been waiting to see some sort of a comparative uh, narrative about these four uh there are also other versions but i've um, restricted if you if you want to say myself to these four because they've all been rewritten and reclaimed by uh women women writers and i think that's a very important lens when it comes to draupadi um for two reasons one is unlike a lot of other women who are currently being reclaimed uh whether it's kunti or ahalya or shabri or you know any of the other women in the mahabharata or any scriptural text um you'll find that all of them exist in some form as the worshipped um they get turned into goddesses there are chants and there are songs about them or they occur uh so you'll have um ahalya dhara karam right or shabri is a very important part of of uh, you know the folklore they are venerated in many ways and draupadi is sure she is venerated um which she's also i think somewhere seen as a woman of misfortune someone who lived with misfortune brought misfortune so possibly that's the reason why uh so yes she she is an epitome of devotion to her husbands uh but nobody wants to have to go through anything that she went through and because of that uh i believe there is an ashtavali of uh draupadi and there are these 108 names but it isn't something that's chanted on a regular basis you won't find housewives uh you know putting her picture up and offering prayers or you know including her in their uh devotions and uh the second thing is if you notice every woman who writes the story of draupadi lays claim to her as um uh, uniquely rescuing her from the narrative she uh is traditionally told in and i think that's an important thing to know that's an important lens to keep in mind with Dra- a figure like draupadi uh because that is what draupadi's oeuvre is that each woman who comes to her claims her as her own and believes that her own lens is the lens that rescues her and this is essentially what draupadi also does in the books with the people around her she is the woman who decides to take her lens and apply it to the situation um and rescue whether it's her husbands or her mother in law or subhadra or you know anybody in uh, rukmini um so it's very interesting to go through uh these books and see that these women writers each very firmly believes it's almost like krishna who uh, as he multiplied could make everybody who was devoted to him believe that they were the gopika rukmini also uh, draupadi also seems to have that uh capacity to make every woman who reads her or writes her believe that they are unique and special to her and this is often a um, overlooked aspect of uh, the manifestation of uh, a divine force uh i will try and keep my comments about each of the books uh short since there are four of them i would like to begin with 
Draupadi, The Tale of an Empress, written by Sai Swarupa. And I will finish with Mahashweta Devi's Dra Draupadi, uh, mainly because she is sort of like the anti-Draupadi. So we begin with the more traditional telling. And the reason why I say that Sai Swarupa is a, a traditional uh, teller of the tale is because she is not a writer who is seeking to modernize Draupadi. She herself is very rooted in the scriptural context. And of course, like uh, even in the song of Draupadi, you'll find Ira Mukherti saying that she also refers to the critical edition translated by Mr. Vivek Debroy, which Sai Swarupa also does. Uh, but Sai also goes to regional tellings, including the uh, Telugu version and uh, folklore and folk song. Um, but the reason I say that uh, Sai Swarupa is a, a traditional telling is she is not angry with the structure in which Draupadi is. She is not changing the structure. She is uh, simply correcting the perspective of that structure and um, pointing out that Draupadi is somebody who did have choice within her context, who was fierce, who was ambitious, who was brought up by her father, who inherited um, you know, uh, a legacy of uh, statesmanship strategy. Um, she was groomed to be an empress. And uh, she also received the training that was her due as a princess of the time. So Sai remaining rooted within the structure is not reclaiming her from the structure. She, her rescue of Draupadi is not from the structure, but from the, um, but her rescue is of those who have sort of distorted the lens of the structure. Having said which, I actually found Sai Swarupa's, though very simply told, the others are far more mellifluous and, you know, extravagant in their telling of this tale. They sort of paint you a picture. Sai Swarupa is far more um, uh, tactile. Her book is a book of action. and um, But yet I find it far more radical. And I'll tell you why. Uh, because, um, you know, as she goes to the sources, and I find I'll read a little bit from her introduction, uh, she says, some regard her as a manifestation of Sashi, the wife of, wife of Lord Indra. Those engaged in Shastric discourses praise her as the wife who took the institution of Vivaha to a new level. And it was the scholarly premise driving Andhra Mahabharata Mood, the Telugu recreation of Mahabharata composed between 11th century to 14th century CE. And here's where it gets interesting. She says, the poets of this composition regard Draupadi as the Icha Shakti, that is desire, the, pro the propelling force of initiative that was powered by the Jnana Shakti of Lord Krishna, that is knowledge, taken to fruition by the Kriya Shakti of the Pandavas, which is action. And while she uh, tells the story in a way it, that is her attempt to be extremely authentic to the original text and scripture. Um, she is rigidly bound by uh, a, that attempt to be true to it. She is immensely, um, her text is immensely populated. There is a lot happening, as does happen in the Mahabharata, and uh, Sai doesn't feel the need to exclude any of it to you know, make it easy on the reader. Uh, instead, she sort of insists that you know all the underlying factions, motives, agendas, interplays. She weaves this extremely complex web of activity, which can be a little, um, it can make your head spin if you're not very familiar with everybody in the Mahabharata. And Asai sort of expects that on you. She, she uh, tosses that on you. So in, in effect, her telling of Draupadi's story is almost like an action uh, thriller. Uh, it is filled with activity. But here's the thing, her Draupadi is extremely sensuous. Her Draupadi is extremely sexual. 
Uh, this is a book in which um, Draupadi actually has sex several times in this book. And uh, Sai is not in the least bit shy of going there uh, into how Draupadi navigated this relationship. And if you notice, um, the other tellings of Draupadi hint at the sexual intimacy between her and five uh, partners, but they, they don't get into it, into the, um, uh, they don't draw it out in, in nuance and detail because I suspect that is something that a lot of writers, a lot of even thinkers about Draupadi hesitate to go. We hesitate to go there because it is sacred and at the same time, like, you know, yes, I'm very woke and I love poly, the idea of polyandry and polygamy and um, I'm very liberated, but how do I go there? So the question then that you should be asking yourself is how does somebody who is coming from the scriptural context that is essentially traditional, that is essentially conservative and uh, of, of wordly so, uh, how does she manage to play with the sexual tension between Draupati and five husbands? And the reason for that is this explanation where, um, you know, she talks about the manifestation of Ichha Shakti. So that is why Draupadi in this book is sensual, she is sexual, but she is not, that's not a lingering um, uh, beneath the surface sort of feeling. It is explicitly manifested, it is action, she is ambitious, uh, and that desire for kingdom, for the betterment of her husbands, um, for relationships, for grandeur, for revenge, for justice for what she perceives as her sense of dharma. All of that is a very acted upon energy in um, Sai's book. Uh, so uh, I will read to you um, from uh, Sai's version of Draupadi. And um, this is a portion in which Draupadi realizes that Kunti has ambitions and she is a pawn essentially of convenience and then she goes to her father and she realizes he also has strategic ambitions being caught between um, the Kurus of Hastinapura and um, Jarasandha of Magad and uh, this is I feel an important chapter because it sort of makes Draupadi aware of her role beyond being woman, sister, daughter, uh, or even wife, that um, she has to play the game. She has to play the politics. And if she doesn't participate, she will get chewed up by it. So I'm just going to read this to you. The sons of Pandu Draupadi's jaw dropped. Never in the wildest of her dreams had she thought that the assumedly dead sons of the great Pandu and his widow would manage to appear at her swayamva. She stared at the erstwhile queen of Hastinapura clad in humble clothing. I know that the first encounter of my sons with your father was less than friendly, Kunti beamed, brushing Draupadi's hair. But there are always fresh starts. You, as the bride of the rightful heir to the Guru throne, will propel this new beginning, Draupadi. Draupadi pursed her lips. The political intrigue she had thought she had escaped was back, putting her right in the middle of the swirling vortex. Draupadi was not prepared for what came next. The bride of the five famed brothers, Kunti added. Bride of five? Draupadi knew that Kunti would not joke. Suppressing her shock, she stared back at her mother-in-law. I'm sure you must have thought of the slander that will follow, Queen Mother. Slander? Kunti's lips curved on one side as she repeated the word. It follows whoever tries to question the con conventions. But you, daughter of Drupad, don't seem like someone who would fear slander. The widow of Pandu looked at her with an intensity that conveyed a lot more than her words. Ambition? 
Besides, will you be satisfied with being anything less than a queen? Then you should be the bride of my firstborn, Yudhishthir. Draupadi's eyes narrowed at what she thought was blatant manipulation. But she knew Kunti's words could not be taken lightly. Draupadi had heard of her tumultuous journey as a coy princess who had briefly enjoyed the status of the Empress of Bharat before destiny had thrown her into a life of uncertainty, misery and peril. But the lioness of a woman had survived it all, bringing up five warrior sons, all of whom Draupadi had taken a strong liking to. But at the same time, Draupadi refused to play into manipulative arguments. Queen Mother Kunti, Draupadi leaned forward, a wise survivor like you would know a lot about trusting the right people. When you trust someone to make her a part of your lives, it is also fair that she knows what she is getting into. Kunti's gaze softened and she clutched the handrest, almost unwilling to let go of her heart's secrets. She finally said, Together they survive, together they prevail, together they will overcome their enemies. She saw Draupadi's eyebrows arch and drop as the younger woman considered her words. My demand is unreasonable, so are, but so are the intrigues that face us. That will face you if you choose to enter the Pandu household. Draupadi did not miss the subtle emphasis Kunti put on her late husband's name. Why would she, she say Pandu household and not Kuru household? Draupadi knew that the five brothers had been conceived out of Niyoga, with Pandu being only their namesake father. It did not take her long to figure out that powerful parts of the Kuru household did not accept them. It explained the fire accident. She could choose to walk out of these intrigues by rejecting Arjuna's hand. She knew that the five brothers were not petty and would not persist if she did so. You can weld them together, princess. Like the mind that unites and controls the limbs, they would stay bound to your word and not let your honour be compromised. Kunti betrayed a pang of guilt as Draupadi nodded, unaffected by the radical proposal. Of course, slander will follow my child, but trust the vibrant legacy of our land. We shall figure out a way to convince the conservative minds. There are wise elders who stand by you. For a woman at the threshold of Vanaprastha, a stage where people renounce material attachments, Kunti seemed too driven. For a moment, Draupadi questioned her own lack of ambition. But the meeting with the erstwhile Empress of Bharat kindled a new flame within her. Bidding Kunti a pol- polite farewell for the moment, Draupadi spent the rest of the day contemplating. It was time for the evening meal when she sought Drupad's ad- audience. The king of Panchala was close to ecstatic upon knowing the identity of the winning suitor. Draupadi had not seen him in such a good mood since many years. Believe me or not, I always dreaded the day you would leave us for your marital home, he beamed, serving her sweet. With Duryodhan becoming the crown prince of Hastinapur, the place will not treat you with the respect you truly deserve if you enter as Arjuna's bride. Drupad spoke, looking at her intently. It would be wise to carve out a principality and crown your husband as its king. It will please me immensely to have you both settle down in Kampilya itself. Years of observing her father's statecraft had trained Draupadi to maintain an unaffected demeanour while her mind furiously decrypted the unspoken intent. Drupad, unaware of Kunti's proposal, had made his own plans of somehow convincing Arjuna to leave his brothers to their own fate and possibly make a tool of his son-in-law to achieve his own aims. Drupad, she knew, was not capable of wicked ambitions like Jarasandha, but stuck between the Kurus and Jarasandha and after losing a significant portion of his own kingdom in an ego battle, Drupad was a prisoner of his own mounting insecurities. Draupadi averted her gaze and carefully gathered her words. The one who weds me shall claim his rightful inheritance from the Kuru's father. And so you see, Draupadi comes to this realization that she is a pawn in a political intrigue and then she is essentially a woman who functions on her own terms. Now when next I, I'll be reading from Ira um, uh, Song of Draupadi and um, it is very much a song, it's very lyrical, it's very beautiful and poetic. I particularly love the uh, opening chapter. 
बिकॉज एसेंशली इरा क्रिएट्स दिस मोमेंट ऑफ द्रौपदी इज बर्थ विच इज बोथ द डेथ ऑफ अ प्रीवियस लाइफ एंड द बर्थ इन टू अ न्यू लाइफ एंड वेन यू रीड इट यू यू बिगिन नॉट नोइंग वेदर शी इज टॉकिंग अबाउट अ डेथ ऑफ अ और अ बर्थ and that is because draupadi was essentially born through the abhichara sacrifice she was born as a weapon for her father's um uh, vengeance um and um along with her brother drushtadimna her twin uh opens but the way that ira basically opens the book is a stunning play of uh magic of um the wheel of time sort of coming full circle of birth and death of good and bad and it's an absolutely brilliant opening uh which is she is also uh as i mentioned earlier uh, has referred to the um critical edition of the mahabharata um but she's spaced it out it's more contemplative and reflective and lyrical than sais i would go to sais for the facts the uh, extremely detailed uh, narratives of who is related to whom and why and motivations and agendas and undercurrents and i would come to era to reflect on them and how this great movement almost like a choreographed dance through time Uh, how the strands interweave and how they play out in people's lives um i can just reflect on just the first line from ira's book where she says eons have passed since the woman began her journey with these five men capital w and a capital m i'll just read that to you again It's a sentence that uh, is worth contemplating. Eons have passed since the woman began her journey with these five men. There is something so essential in the way she strips down the story of Draupadi and the Panch Pandavas to woman, a sort of primordial woman, and five men in a sense. the panchabhutas the elements air water fire right it um and that's where ira's work has the power of contemplation i'll read you a bit of this first chapter because it's very stunning eons have passed since the woman began her journey with these five men New worlds have spun and coalesced out of nothingness and now at last her once incandescent rage has forged her into a shimmering clean thing They have journeyed before for glory for vengeance and once for salvation but on this final journey they have come looking for death It was the elder's decision and the other four brothers stood alongside him without a murmur as they have done all their lives except once when the second eldest spat and snarled at the eldest but that was a long time ago it was surprisingly easy to walk out of the desolation of their echoing palace to bow one final time before the sacrificial fires guarded by the flinty austere priests who have kept the three fires burning their entire adult lives easy also to remove the gold earrings waistbands and necklaces untie the fine silk dhotis and lay down at last the iron tipped arrows and heavy wooden bows they leave all this behind like a sigh like a half remembered dream the woman kept only her gold anklets with the little golden bells she has a premonition that a time will come when its soft murmur will be her only solace for days then weeks and months they crossed the marshlands and forests to the north of their kingdom before arriving at the dense deciduous foothills of the himalayas here they turn away the last of their retinue the ossified priests and the keening elderly maids 
only a dog remains with them stubborn and optimistic eyes filled with the unconditional love of a child the five men and the woman remove their white cotton dhotis their overgarments and turbans and replace them with clothes of bark reed and wool fibrous organic garments more like a feral skin than clothes they walk for days up the mountain slopes foraging for food and sleeping in the rough shelter of shallow caves conversation slips away and their movements become dense and slow they carefully gather fruits berries and roots which they eat raw the taste a smoky earthiness that makes them feel lightheaded the dog disdains their leafy offerings and disappears on most days returning triumphant and bloody with a scrawny hair on indolent crow fe- crow pheasant in its deceptively lethal jaws Eventually they reach the high passes where the sacred geography of eternal snow and the subterranean mythical rivers beguiles and blinds them. Their footsteps are muffled now. The woman's anklets are quiet as her feet sink deep into the freshly fallen powdery snow. The men are fiercely gone, ancient scars from forgotten battles hidden among the folds of their now loose skin. I'll skip a little bit ahead. Come back she cries again her voice strangled by sobs don't leave me alone her sobs make a painful rasping sound but no one comes back for her not even the dog who is an ungainly shadow next to the eldest the snow starts to fall gently in sparse economical drifts the woman gathers a few snowflakes in her palm and scoops them into her mouth amazed at the clear taste like eating a cloud She looks out at the distant horizon where the sky glows pomegranate red in a suffused band behind the peaks. As the snowflakes gather softly on her eyelashes, the crimson warmth of the sun awakens an ancient memory in the woman. She feels her being scattered into nothingness and catapulted through the meager mountain air into the wide open skies. She can sense that her body is still in the snow, shallow breaths barely lifting. the rugs and skins as her other spectral being rushes towards the fire and heat of an older primal time uh i've just read a few selected sort of lines from here and there with some continuity um but as you can tell ira is is lyrical is beautiful as you uh, you know go into the text you'll find that she makes a lot of use of um smells fragrances colors um it's a very descriptive book and that in itself allows you the space to contemplate the characters that are within it um she doesn't do any less justice to uh the progress of events she just doesn't um pin them across multiple characters in the way that sai does uh so the interweave is a more slow to become apparent uh i particularly loved her description of devavrata um son of shantanu and how he become bhishma it's almost agonizing and um you when you consider draupadi um in this book she seems a little less she, though she is also um in this book draupadi has her mother uh in sai's book the timelines differ a little in that uh, draupadi uh is very much a part of uh, the insult to uh, king drupad the king of panchal uh, by drona uh in this book she is born after the insult and as a result of the insult so um in she has her mother as a guiding force in sai's book the father is almost a justification for why dropadi is so fierce it is his upbringing it is his um uh, the access he provides to this kind of training and state statesmanship in princeliness in education um which sai seems to point out it was also available to the women of the day um in this book she is more in the sense when you come to her a child uh she has to be 
grown into her role and uh, therefore there is a slowness to the um, curve of the narrative but you will also find you know various uh, incidents sort of overlapping across the books i will go to the third one now which is uh, chitra banerji divakarni and uh, chitra doesn't um to of course she also stays uh, on track in terms of she isn't like wildly off tangent with uh, uh of course she isn't wildly off tangent with her narrative in terms of um it is attuned to the um uh, the flow of the scriptural text but chitras is basically a story and she weaves this fantastic story full of magic full of um despair full of a woman who is determined to outrun her circumstances to stand up and be something beyond them and i feel that of the three that we've read so far uh in there is a bit of helplessness in uh, draupadi until she grows up in uh, ira's book but in chitras she seems to be a woman who um has carries this burden of despair around her and um her friendships with krishna her connection with karna um these are things that allow her with arjuna with the men in her life and how she positions herself um against them uh or or beside them allow her to come into her own she is essentially uh, in the palace of illusions a woman who has to see the truth of the world uh, the truth of a very male world in which she is yes again a pawn uh but she is also somebody who's determined not to be a pawn uh of the three books so far i find that in ira's book uh the progress of circumstances feels more fated in uh chitras um there is the intervention of divine uh circumstance happening um inside there is, seems to be the sort of direction towards the fates in ira's book it is a little less known you are directed but you do not know that you are being directed and uh, one of my favorite um, uh, chapters in chitra's book is sorceress i'll begin reading that to you one morning the sorceress arrived but why do i call her that she looked no different from the women who sold their wares in the marketplace with the pleats of her blue sari tucked peasant fashion between her legs a faint smell of salted fish wafted from her who are you daimar demanded how did you get past the guards she had a star tattooed on her chin and muscled arms with which she moved daima not urgently out of her way daima stared her mouth a gape at the woman's effrontery I expected her to shout for the sentry or berate the woman with her usual belligerence but she did neither. I've been sent, the sorceress said to me, to fill some of the bigger gaps in your largely useless education. I didn't protest. Secretly I agreed with her estimation of my lessons. I was interested in seeing what she had to offer. Who sent you? I asked. I had a suspicion it was Vyasa the sage. He too came from fish of oak. She grinned. Her teeth were very white in her dark face. The edge is sharp and serrated. Your first lesson, princess, is to know how to sidestep questions you don't want to answer. You do it by ignoring them. The rest of that week she taught me how to dress hair. She taught me how to wash it, oil it, comb the tangles out of it and braid it into a hundred different designs. She had me practice on her and rebuked me sharply if I pulled too hard or snagged a tress. Her hair was kinky and unruly, difficult to handle. So I received many such admonishments. I took them with unaccustomed meekness. 
Dhaima puffed out her cheeks in disapproval. Ridiculous, she said emphatically, though not, I noticed, in the sorceress's hearing. Who ever heard of a queen braiding someone's hair, or even her own for that matter? But I felt the sorceress had her reasons, and I worked hard until she declared herself satisfied. The sorceress taught me other unque- unqueenly skills. She made me lie on the floor at night with only my arm for a pillow until I could sleep under those conditions. She made me wear the cheapest, most abrasive cotton saris that chafed my skin until I grew used to them. She made me eat what the lowest of my servants ate. She taught me to live on fruit, then water, and then to fast for days at a time. That woman's going to be the death of you, Daima wailed. She's wearing you down to skin and bone. But this was not true. The sorceress had taught me a yogic breath that filled me with energy so that I needed no other sustenance. The breath made my mind one-pointed and I began to glimpse subtleties that had been invisible to me before. I noticed that her lessons went in opposites. She taught me adornments to enhance my beauty. She taught me how to make myself so ordinary that no one would spare me a second glance. She taught me to cook with the best of ingredients and the most meagre. She taught me potions to cure illness and potions to cause them. She taught me to be unafraid of speaking out and to be brave enough for silence. She taught me when to lie and when to speak the truth. She taught me to discover a man's hidden tragedies by reading the tremor in his voice. She taught me to close myself off from the sorrow of others so that I might survive. I understood that she was preparing me for the different situations that would appear in my life. I tried to guess what shape they might take, but here I failed. I failed also in this, though I knew all that she had taught me was important. In my vanity, I only learned the ones that flattered my ego. Toward the end, she taught me seduction, the first role a wife must play. She demonstrated how to send out a lightning glance from the corner of the eye, how to bite slightly the swollen lower lip, how to make bangles ring as I raised my arm to pull a transparent veil into place, how to walk the back swaying just enough to hint at hidden pleasure. She said, in bed, you must be different each day, sensitive to your Lord's moods. Sometimes a lioness, sometimes a trembling dove, sometimes doe, matching its partner's fleetness. She gave me herbs, some for instability, some for endurance, some for the days I might want to keep a man away. What about love? I asked. The stalk of the blue lotus, ground into honey, will make a man mad for you, she said. That's not what I meant. She gave me the name of an herb to arouse my own desire. No, teach me how to love my husband and how to make him love me. She laughed out loud. I can't teach you that, she said. Love comes like lightning and disappears the same way. If you're lucky, it strikes you right. If not, You'll spend your life yearning for a man you can't have. I advise you to forget about love, princess. Pleasure is simpler and duty more important. Learn to be satisfied with them. I should have believed her and modified my expectations. But I didn't. Deep in my stubborn heart, I was convinced I deserved more. Such a beautiful, um, you know, bit of narration over there. Uh, I just love Chitra Banerjee Devakarni's writing with no disrespect to the other narrators of uh, Draupadi. Each one is their own uh, idiom, their own lens. Um, and uh, I find reading four like this, one after the other, just fascinating. Um, because it shows you in terms of writing, in terms of thought, how you can play with a story, with language in completely different and unique ways. Um, And also, as I said in the beginning, the ways in which that in Draupadi speaks to a part of you that um, is primed for her, that is your lens to the world. And uh, you might find incidents 
uh, for instance in ira's uh, work also dropati uh, as a child runs into an darbar and, and sits on her father's lap bursts into an assembly of people both in completely different circumstances and both in completely different ways and that in itself is uh, one of the reasons why the mahabharata is told and retold and retold because through centuries through time simply because every time you read it or every time you hear it as it was done in the past it is not the lens of the narrator that influences you so much as what you have uh you know experienced lived and attuned to in your own life and uh i i strongly urge you to read uh, you know all uh, four versions and i think mahashweta devi's is what i will end with i know she needs no commentary or thought from me so i'm just going to get the book and read you a few sentences of the opening um uh paras and leave you to reflect on them she's essentially the anti draupadi um completely fierce and fighting against uh, a patriarchal state so let's get on to draupadi by mahashweta devi mahashweta devi is draupadi d o p d i uh, occurs in a collection called the breast stories and uh, i'm reading from gayatri spivak um introduction and she says it is the aboriginal dopadi and the migrant proletarian gango who are the subjects of resistant rage their names bear the mark of their distance from the top the aboriginal's immediate dopadi although she was named dropadi by her brahmin mistress and the dalit's historical gango from ganagori corrupt through usage Here too, there is a difference. We are as sure of the derivation of Draupadi from Draupadi as we are of the author's hardly implicit point of view. The story of Draupadi, the narrative efficient cause of the battle of the great epic Mahabharata, is well known in India. God had prevented male lust from unclothing her, and she had had five husbands. This Draupadi, gang raped by police. refuses to be clothed by men in office Dulna and Dopadi went underground for a long time in a neanderthal darkness the special forces attempting to pierce that dark by an armed search compelled quite a few santals in the various district of west bengal to meet their maker against their will By the Indian constitution all human beings regardless of caste or creed are sacred still accidents like this do happen two sorts of reasons one the underground couple's skill in self concealment two not merely the santhals but all tribes of the austroasiatic munda tribes appear the same to the special forces in fact all around the ill-famed forest of jarkhan which is under the jurisdiction of the police station at B- bankrajad in the sindhya of us even a worm is under a certain police station even in the southeast and southwest corners one comes across hair raising details in the eyewitness records put together on the people who are suspected of attacking police stations stealing guns since the snatchers are not invariably well educated they sometimes say give up your chambers rather than give up your gun killing green brokers landlords money lenders law officers and bureaucrats a black skinned couple ululated like police sirens before the episode they sang jubilantly in a savage tongue incomprehensible even to the santhals such as samare hijulena ko mar gokupe and hendre rambra kheche kheche pundi rambra kheche kheche this proves conclusively that they are the cause of captain arjun singh's diabetes government procedure being as incomprehensible as the male principle in sankhya philosophy or antonioni's early films 
It was Arjun Singh who sent once again on operation for Jharkhand. Learning from intelligence that the above mentioned ululating and dancing couple was the escaped corpses, Arjun Singh fell for a bit into a zombie-like state and finally acquired so irrational a dread of black-skinned people that whenever he saw a black person in a ball bag, he swooned, saying, They're killing me, and drank and passed a lot of water. Neither uniform nor scriptures could relieve that depression. At long last, under the shadow of a premature and forced retirement, it was possible to present him at the desk of Mr. Sena Nayak, the elderly Bengali specialist in combat and extreme left politics. I will stop there with that brief sort of narration from Dopdir by Mahashweta Devi. As you can tell, she is very much the anti Draupadi. There's nothing lyrical about her. There's nothing beautiful or sensual about her. In fact, she is a manifestation of Draupadi's pure rage against the structure, of being pushed into positions that she doesn't want to be in, of being a pawn, of circumstance, of time and uh, determining not to be taken down by it. I hope you've enjoyed this contemplation on the multiple Draupadis. I think it's uh, a beautiful figure that lends itself to a very dynamic and extensive contemplation that will evolve and change depending on the frame of mind you're in, the perspective you're in, the phase of life you're in, where you come from and what you believe and what you perceive about the world. And Draupadi is a figure, a lens that allows that, actually insists on that. And it's important to see her as a manifestation of that inner will, Ichha Shakti, but also just Shakti. The music you'll notice that accompanies this podcast chants the names of all the women except Draupadi. And it's there for a reason. Uh, Women like us, women who are rebellious, belligerent, who break convention, go against the tide to get what we want, even if others benefit from us. Our names are never chanted, not in the same way that others are. And yet we persist. The very fact that multiple women at multiple levels are reclaiming Draupadi for themselves is testimony to that. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. Uh, I hope you'll come back for the next one and I promise I'll keep it to one book (laughs) this time. See you soon.